Join me in prayer, if you would. <clears throat> Father, the psalmist has said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So, Father, we are grateful that that same command and invitation has not only been given to us, but embraced by us. And yet, Father, we have taken this, we have, we experienced this at a whole other level. For it is not the building that we assemble in that is the house of the Lord, but it is the assembly of your people themselves. And it is actually your people who are temples and houses of your presence. So, Father, come and inhabit the praises of your people as we lift up praise to you. Come and encourage and do that work which only you can do. Hundreds and hundreds of needs are represented here. And you, Holy Spirit, can take that word and minister to each and every one. Do it gloriously, and we will give you the praise of your glorious grace. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible uh, in, calls us into the worship of our God, and we come together to give Him praise because we're forgiven. And that word of pardon that I would share with you this morning comes from Romans 8.1. And I love a three-letter word in this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of what Christ Jesus has done, we are forgiven. And because we are forgiven, we might live unto Him, the Lord of glory, and this morning assemble to give Him praise and glory. The Bible tells us to greet one another, and we'll do that in just a moment. Then we'll sing that wonderful hymn. Uh, that the turn of the century became popular in the United States, Lift High the Cross. It was written originally by an Anglican pastor, and it was written as a processional hymn that they would come in and the cross would be carried in while the pastors would come to the platform. They would lift it up singing, Lift High the Cross. But quickly, the hymn became a recessional hymn. And the people of God begin to love it, particularly in America, as a recessional hymn that leads us out 
into the battle for Jesus Christ because of His victory in the cross. Think of it as your recessional hymn leading you out into the world to serve Christ. When you sing it, after you greet one another, the Lord be with you. Stand and greet one another in the Lord. I am Harry Reeder, Senior Pastor at Briarwood Presbyterian Church, and at this moment our congregation is turned and they're greeting one another in the name, love, and peace that is found in Jesus Christ. Now on behalf of them, I would like to greet you and welcome you to this worship service and ask that you now join us as we rise into the presence of God to give Him praise. Thank you for joining us on WLJR Radio or streaming online at Briarwood.org.
Sanctity of Life Sunday this morning. It's our pleasure to have a guest with us, Molly Ann Dutton. Molly Ann is the uh, daughter of Peggy Dutton, and many of you may remember Peggy. She was here as a member years ago, and uh, Molly Ann literally was in our nursery and uh, in children's Sunday school when she was here. Molly Ann is now a student at the U- Auburn University, and she was recently elected homecoming queen uh, at Auburn. God has granted to her a wonderful uh, story of His sovereign grace in her life, and we've asked Molly Ann to come and share that with you this morning. Would you welcome Molly Ann Dutton? Good morning. Um, before I get started, I just would love it if y'all could align your hearts with me in prayer. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we come before you this morning as brothers and sisters, and Father, we just present a platter of thanksgiving unto you, and thank you so much for who you are, and you are not good because of the blessings you give to us, but you're good because you're God, and um, I savor that. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the aroma and the fragrance and your image to bear, and I just pray that you will um, speak through me just for this short time, but most importantly, I pray that ears and hearts may be open to your word, and thank you so much that your words do not turn void in your matchless name, I pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. And I just um, wanted to come before you and just share a story of the Lord's love and adoption on this Sunday. And um, I'm the youngest of six kids. Like Mr. Stalling said, we, um, some of us were raised in this church. I was just a little girl. So my first memory in this church was um, holding onto the thresholds, not wanting to leave my mom in Sunday school as a child or playing out in the courtyard. So it's kind of cool to be back. But Um, The latter four of us, six kids, are all adopted, and we're different ages, different sizes, different genders, different skin colors, and I was thinking about this morning when I was coming to talk to y'all how cool that is, how it's reflective of the Lord's kingdom, and how we are all sons and daughters into his kingdom, and out of the four of us, we each have different stories, and my story um, is one I want to share with you this morning. I'm My birth mother was a young married woman who lived in California, and through some series of events, she actually found herself the victim of sexual assault. And through that anguish and despair, she um, soon realized that she was pregnant. And I can't, I'm sure some of us, a lot of us can't imagine that feeling and that um, kind of hopelessness of the situation. And she went to her husband to receive comfort and wisdom in that time. And he just presented an ultimatum before her to either abort the child or suffer a divorce, easy as that. And she um, apparently had adoption on her heart because she hopped on a plane and came down here to Birmingham, Alabama. And she had um, family down here, but obviously that was of the Lord that that led her to Birmingham. And she found Lifeline Children's Services and um, Lifeline provided counseling for her during that time. And my parents just so happened to be working on the board at that time. And that just displays the Lord's sovereignty, you know, 22 years ago. And because she walked into the doors, um, into Lifeline, she then decided to give birth to me. And here I am standing before you 22 years later. And obviously the Lord has produced so much fruit in that. And what the enemy has intended for harm, the Lord is using it according to his will and purpose. And so today, what does that look like? Well, just back in October, I actually... um, I was honored to run for Miss Homecoming at Auburn University and won. And during that whole week of campaigns and a lot of the family members of this church really helped me during that time. But I wanted to do something on Auburn's campus. The Lord used me to speak life into people and show them our exact picture of our adoption in Christ. And it wasn't, hey, my name's Molly Ann Dutton, vote for me because I'm as cute as a button because we so could have done that. But instead it was... Hey, do you have two minutes? Can I share a story with you? And that was so beautiful. And just God on on that Saturday, standing on the 50-yard line of Jordan Hare, he just used that as such a leaping pad for the glory and honor that was to come in his name. And when it comes to, and I learned this during campaign week, when it comes to adoption and abortion and life, pro-life, we tend to make it a topic or an issue or debacle that we have um, you know, in a, in a boardroom, or um, I know we just had March for Life, and then if y'all would also keep prayers lifted on Wednesday, I'm speaking at um, the March for Life in D.C., so this, these are topics that are coming in our state and our nation, but this is a story, and we so forget that, and God just wrote such a beautiful story. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith, and I think that's what captivated the hearts of Auburn and what continues to captivate this nation, and how could it not when you have God as the author of this story, but it's not about a topic, it is not about an issue, but it is about the story of our adoption in Christ, and yes, that might be difficult, but look how much good has come out of it, and 
the Lord's taught me immeasurably more through that. And so I just wanted to simply share that story with y'all. And this is a side of the story you don't really hear that much, but um, I'm so thankful that the Lord does send down his words and they do not return empty. Isaiah 55 speaks that. So thank y'all so much. And I said this in the first service, I don't mean to, um, you know, offend anyone in this service, but War Eagle. <laughs> Thank you, Molly Ann, for sharing with us, and not only with us, thank you for sharing God's story in your life with others, and we will pray for you Wednesday, and you can always say War Eagle on this platform. <laughs> I'm going to invite some representatives, if you would come and join me on the stage. On Sanctity of Life Sunday, we want to put before you some of the different ministries that we have the opportunity to participate and partner with, and we've asked them if they would come and let me try to put a, a name with a face and an organization then at the conclusion of the service, when you go out to the foyer, uh, you'll be able to see that they have tables set up and there's a lot of information there and you can get engaged in any one of these or all of these uh, ministries as it relates to uh, the sanctity of life. Let me see if I can introduce uh, everyone. Down on the far end is Lisa Hogan and she's with Save a Life Vestavia and then Kelly Simpson with Save a Life Shelby and of course Save a Life is the pregnancy testing centers that uh, have been established and a great platform and opportunity uh, for the gospel uh, to be shared. And the Lord has so richly blessed that ministry in, in drawing others to salvation as well as protecting uh, of the unborn. And then we have Dr. Lance Radbill. Uh, he is one of the Alabama Physicians for Life, and I would encourage you to uh, be in prayer for them. And uh, as you can imagine, with all of the different, different health care changes and challenges that get put before us and the work that they do to fight and to try to protect the rights uh, to do that through the physicians, uh, wanna, you, you would want to stop by their table and get some information about the Alabama Physicians for Life. And then Lee John Bruno is with us again, United for Life Foundation. And United for Life is a bit of an umbrella organization. There's a lot of work that's done uh, underneath uh, the United for Life with media as it relates to different pro-life uh, causes. And, and locally, they sponsor many things, uh, one of which is the March for Life that uh, took place yesterday. And we had the opportunity and uh, many Briarwood members were uh, there in participation in providing uh, leadership in that, but had the opportunity to march yesterday. And one of the things we were able to celebrate uh, yesterday before we marched was the closing of the last operating uh, abortion center here in Birmingham. So, uh, amen. We're going to pray that that's a permanent closure and that the Lord would not allow that uh, to open. Then over here to my uh, right is Beth Stanley and Stephanie Bates, and they're with Lifeline Children uh, Services. And of course, Lifeline provides services to, uh, to the children in need, to the adoptive families, to the birth mothers, et cetera, through adoption and other uh, means. And so you'll want to learn more about uh, their ministry. And then Marty Hayes is with us. Marty is one of our members, and he heads up our foster care and adoption uh, ministry that is to promote that as well as to be a, a form of service and encouragement and support uh, to them. Then Eric Johnson, a member of our church, is with the Southeastern uh, Law Institute and the uh, Alabama Pro-Life Coalition. Eric works uh, down in Montgomery a lot to, with the legislative uh, issues, but also to help keep us informed. And you'll want to get information uh, from Eric and to find out the issues that are uh, before us so that you'll know how to pray and how to be involved uh, in that regard. Uh, and then on the end is uh, uh, Cheryl Ciamara. She is with the National Right to Life in Washington. Uh, and she is a, that's a national advocate pro for the protection of life. And you may have heard her on the radio. She has a local uh, radio uh, program with uh, pro-life. And so uh, these people will be back in the foyer uh, immediately following our service. They'll have information. And I want to lift them up before us, uh, before the Lord in prayer this morning. So let's do that. And if you would, would you take just a moment and pray silently asking the Lord just to speak to your heart about this issue of the sanctity of life. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, truly the giver of life. <clears throat> Lord, how we thank you for who you are, for the way that you reveal yourself to us. And Lord, we recognize this morning before you that abortion, the killing of the unborn, is not an isolated issue in our land. But Lord, it is truly the fruit of our worldly and selfish culture that embraces the lies of the evil one and not a truth of your word, truth through your son. Lord, it's not hard to know that abortion is wrong. For clearly it's the destruction of that which you've created, of those to whom you have given life. So, Lord, we come 
this morning asking that you would forgive us. Lord, forgive us as a people for allowing, for <coughs> even embracing uh, such atrocious acts. Lord, you know that so many times we personally do not know what it is that you would have us to do. So we ask, Lord, that you would guide us, that you would direct each and every one of us, uh, Lord, that we may respond as you would put your will before us. Lord, that we would fight to have truth prevail, that we would seek to give understanding to those uh, participating. Lord, that we would compassionately care for those contemplating or encouraging abortion, that we would gently love and bring healing to those who've had an abortion. Lord, that we would provide options for the future of children to give them hope in You. And Lord, that we would trust You, trust in You alone, and that we would be good stewards of Your gospel, which is the cure for all sin. Lord, we thank You for these ministries that are before us this morning. We thank You for Your blessing uh, upon them, for the fruit that we have seen uh, through them. Lord, specifically, thank You for closing the last abortion center operating uh, in Birmingham for Your great namesake. And Lord, we do ask, we ask that You would never allow it to reopen. And Lord, we thank You this morning for Molly Ann and uh, the platform that You have granted to her to speak to this generation on the topic of life. And Lord, may You bless her, may You use her in the lives of others. Lord, may you raise up more Molly Ann's that would speak out for you, and others may value life and may honor you. And Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we implore you to bring an end to abortion in our country and throughout the world. For Lord, there's been enough deceit, enough lying, enough killing, enough pain, Lord, enough suffering. Would you bring peace to our land? And then, Lord, we also want to thank you this morning for the life and the ministry and the way that you've used Dr. Martin Luther King in our country. Lord, thank you for using him to help open the eyes of so many to value all life equally. Lord, we pray that you would rid our country, that you would rid us of all racism in the world, in our country, in our churches, and Lord, in our hearts. Would you grant to us unity through the power of your gospel in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, I want to lift our church family before you this morning. There are many who are sick and ailing, many who are mourning this morning. Lord, I lift up Richard Condry and Carl Yancey. Woody Castleberry and Jim Swords and Lancy, uh, Lacey Intrican, Alice Ard and Jack Bailey and Lil Green and Betsy Bancroft. Lord, we pray for Charlie Sullivan and Carolyn Crow and Steve Mace and Lord, so many on the uh, prayer list, the hospital list this morning. Lord, would you bring healing and strength into their lives? And then, Lord, we lift before you Regina Phillips on the death of her husband, Dave, and <clears throat> pray for Debbie Johnson on the death of her mother and Anne Marie Cotton on the death of her mother. Lord, we lift before you Gloria Croom on the death of her husband. Jeff Schofield on the death of his grandmother, Beth Mooney and Connie Livingston on the death of their brother-in-law. Lord, would you comfort these families? Would you um, bring peace into their life? May they feel your presence at this time. Now, Lord, would you receive your tithes and our offerings? Would you take and would you use these gifts to the building of your kingdom, that your name may be honored and glorified, that the gospel of Jesus Christ might spread to the ends of the earth? And Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thank you all. Would you all uh, give them a hand of welcome and appreciate them? Thank you all very much. As our ushers are coming forward for the receiving of the Lord's tithes and our offerings, I want to call to your attention uh, just one item, our Sportsman's Blast. That's an intentional outreach event for men from on February the 7th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Our Sportsman's Blast speaker uh, who comes and shares the gospel this year is going to be Bobby Richardson. You may initially think of Bobby as the second baseman for the New York Yankees, but he's also an avid hunter and a wonderful outdoorsman and, and most of all a man of God. He has a great opportunity to share uh, the gospel with those uh, in attendance, so we would encourage you to join us in that event. The tickets are in sale th on sale this morning in the bookstore or online. If you would all please take the fellowship folder and mark your attendance, pass it along so that everyone gets a chance to mark their attendance, we sure would appreciate that. If you're a guest of this with us this morning, thank you for being here, for joining us in worship of our Heavenly Father. We would ask you as a guest just to give us a little bit of information so that we could appropriately respond to your visit with us this morning. I would invite you as a fo to the foyer immediately following this service. Our pastor, his wife Cindy, are going to be back there. I would love to greet you on behalf of the church as well as to extend you a gift.
speak up for the little ones Helpless and half abandoned They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose I've got to speak up, won't you? Equal rights, equal time for the unborn children. Their precious lives are on the line. Oh, how can we be rid of them? Passing laws, passing out bills and new amendments. Pay the cost, then turn about and face the young defendants who will speak up for the little ones, helpless and half abandoned. They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose. I've got to speak up. Won't you? Many come and many go Conceive but not deliver The toll is astronomical Oh, how can we be indifferent? Little hands, little feet Tears for him who made you Should all on earth forsake you now Yet he'll never forsake you Who will speak up for the little ones Helpless and half abandoned They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose. I've got to speak up, won't you? Forming hearts, forming minds, quenched before awakened. For so many deliberate crimes, the earth will soon be shaken. Little hands, little feet, tears for him who made you. Should all on earth forsake you now, yet he'll never forsake you. Who will speak up for the little ones, helpless and half abandoned? They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose. I've got to speak up. Won't you? I've got to speak up, won't you? Would you please stand for our confession of truth? This morning our confession of truth comes from the 139th Psalm. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. Together, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written 
every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. the strength to the task through your people. You are our strength. Without you, we can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The task for the saved of grace to serve the Lord of grace to the glory of his grace is enormous. Many battlefields. We want to stay in the fight, so strengthen us, direct us, May the victory of Christ and his cross be seen and life prevail, glorious, saving life in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. If you're able, please remain standing and turn in your copies of God's Word to James. We continue in our 10th study of the gospel life according to James. If you'll turn there with me, if you're visiting with us and perhaps don't have a Bible with you, we've tried to make one available there. It should be there in, your, in front of you on the pew. Please feel just to turn to 1011, page 1011, and you'll be right with us. And we're studying verses 26 through 27, but I want to read for context verses 19 through 25, then we'll focus in. And let's also see how this glorious text relates very powerful to our subject matter of the sanctity of life uh, today. Uh, Let me just mention to you 
uh, not only to make use of this sportsman's blast, take full advantage of it. Bobby does a great job of presenting the gospel, and I know that will be a great outreach uh, opportunity. But also, please be sure and take the time after the service to see our guests that are here and take advantage of some of these various ways that we can engage in this ministry of the sanctity of life. Look with me in verse 19. This is God's Word. It's the truth, infallible and inerrant. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face or the face of his birth in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's the way James sums up the Old Testament and its fulfillment in Christ, the redeeming, liberating law of the Lord and perseveres, perseveres in looking at the mirror, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. Here's the beatitude. He will be blessed in his doing. Now, what is the blessing of his doing? Well, he's about to tell us in verses 26 through 27. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades. God's Word abides forever. By His grace and mercy, may this His Word be preached for you And before I get to 26 and 27, you're going to see the word religious come up three times in those verses. So I thought what I would begin with is something, how many of you have ever heard this phrase? Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. How many of you all ever heard that? Yeah. Uh, There was a time I actually used to say that. Is that accurate? Is that true or is that false? Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Or there's a corollary companion statement that I hear a lot. Well, pastor, I'm a Christian. I'm just not religious. Which, by the way, if statement one's true, statement two ought to be true. If Christianity is not a religion but a relationship, then it seems to be okay to say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm just not religious. But is it, and that one also, does that quite ultimately, even though we kind of get a sense of the heart behind those statements, is it accurate, biblically? Or I remember a discipleship book that was going around years ago how to be a Christian without being religious. How to be a Christian without being religious. Well, every time somebody says that to me, I, uh, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, then I, there's a little piece of me that wants to kind of come back a little bit because of trying to work my way through this. And I will say, hopefully very graciously, oh, so the First Amendment of this country doesn't cover you. You don't know the First Amendment, all right? Bill of Rights. It will not prohibit the free exercise of what? So I guess that doesn't cover us since Christianity is not a religion. And all of our forebearers who used to write and talk about the Christian religion, they must have all been mistaken. Or... Or, even more precisely, what would James say about this? James, the half-brother of Jesus, pastor of the church at Jerusalem, thousands of pastors, thousands of members, would die for the faith. What would James say if I told him, well, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship? What would he say to me? This is the guy that wrote this book. It's probably the first book written, more than likely the first book written in the New Testament, 
written about 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus, probably about 15 years prior to the death of James himself. It's a gospel book of wisdom that takes all of the anticipatory wisdom of the Old Testament books, like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and brings them to fruition in this gospel wisdom book, the book of James. What would James say? All right, let me just take, before I get to what I think James would say from verses 26 through 27, let me take about three minutes and make sure we're all up together, all together. If you're visiting with us, it's wonderful to have you. You've stepped into the 10th study that actually falls on the sanctity of life, and because of its content, I didn't feel any necessity to change uh, our normal course, and I think you'll see why in just a moment. But what we're studying is uh, together is this book that James has written, this epistle of five chapters the most quoted book, and it's a book of gospel wisdom. It is the gospel life. Here's the thematic statement that we're working from. It is the gospel life. The gospel life is a life of one, persistent ministry. Two, joyful maturation. You're always growing. How? In a sin-cursed world. All of, the eff- all of the effects of sin are all around us in a sin-cursed world. So how can we live this life? Well, we have to be informed by the God-given gift of wisdom from above. In other words, you've got a gospel foundation in Christ. You've got a gospel motivation, the love of Christ. And now you're getting a gospel reformation of your mind with gospel wisdom, which then allows you to make decisions to the glory of Christ as you encounter the challenges of life. Well, one of those things that we encounter are trials. So he uses trials to give us the first gospel wisdom maxim in chapter 1. And that first gospel wisdom maxim is this, is the way you at is that in the multifaceted and inevitable trials of life, they have been designed by the sovereign hand of God's grace. They may be meant by evil by Satan, but what he means for evil, God means for good. And because these trials come into our life, they do three things. They prove to us what we already know. That's what a test does. A test shows you what you know. It also reveals what you need to know, the wisdom we need to grow in. Thirdly, it will reveal any strongholds of idolatry because when the test, what makes the test into a temptation is when I have an idolatrous desire in which I don't respond with maturation or growth or perseverance, I fall into sin, which brings death. How does that sin come? Well, uh, James says it's because your desire married the temptation, and those parents produce sin, which produces the death of a testimony or of a witness or, or sometimes of a marriage or, or all of those things that take place or a child. When wisdom from above is set aside for wisdom from below because the test took hold of us and we faltered. But in Christ, even that can become the opportunity for growth and the assurance of forgiveness. So what do we do in the… If I need this wisdom from above so that I can destroy the strongholds of idolatry left in my heart, so that I can keep growing in grace, how do I get it? Well, he tells you, first of all, you get it through prayer. So that's gospel wisdom maxim number two. The way you get it is gospel wisdom, essential for the Christian life, comes from above. All right, if it comes from above, how do I get this unmerited gift of God's grace from above through Christ, who is my wisdom? Well, you gain it in your life through persistent, believing prayer. If, you, if, you, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. Now, don't be double-minded. You need persistent believing prayer. Be single-minded that the Lord freely gives it and a prioritized receiving of God's Word with preparation and purpose. So, now you want to become a hearer of the Word, and you want to be a hearer who is prepared. Be quick to, be quick to learn, slow to speak, slow to anger, and then set aside as you're coming to hear God's Word, set aside wickedness in your life and rampant wickedness. Receive the Word with meekness, with a teachable heart, examining the Scriptures to see if these things are so. And as you are hearing the Word, you've prioritized the hearing of God's Word. You've prepared for the hearing of God's Word. And then you have a purpose. What is the purpose? You want to be a doer of the Word. You don't want to be a hearer who deceives himself. 
There's three times, oh, two times he's used the word deception. Don't let worldly wisdom deceive you, and don't deceive yourself by being a hearer only. A hearer only is someone who deceives themselves because they come to the word of truth, and he calls it a mirror. He said it's like looking into a mirror, and you look at yourself, and then you walk away, and when you walk away from the mirror, you forget what you saw, and when you forget what you saw, then you leave the word that you've heard. He said, here's the key. Can't tell you how to do it? Take the mirror with you. Persevere in looking at the mirror. Take it with you. How do you do that? Well, you can take it with you technologically, put it on your iPad, iPod, Blueberry, Blackberry, uh, whatever you want to do, but take it with you incarnationally, take it with you through obedience. Don't you love the way he's taken the Bible preached and he calls it a mirror? Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you looked at the mirror before you left today? Oh, no, okay, don't raise your hand. I know that's a tough thing to do. I guarantee you every one of you did it. You looked at your mirror. Why did you look? Isn't it interesting he called the Bible, the Bible preached and heard a mirror. You don't look in the mirror to go see what you're going to do today. Before you leave the house, you didn't look in the mirror to find out what to do. You looked at the mirror to find out who you were. And when we look at the mirror, we say, My natural face is I'm a helpless, hopeless sinner. But in Christ, I not only am forgiven and righteous and strengthened by His Holy Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I want to take the mirror with me. The way a guy that discipled me used to call it is uh, no be do. No be do. That is not a character in Star Wars. No be do. No be do is... Know, look in the mirror. Know who you are apart from Christ. Know who you are in Christ. Be who you are in Christ. Now you're ready to do for Christ. Well, when you do for Christ, you'll be blessed in your doing. What does that look like? Okay, let me, let me go ahead and give you the answer to my question earlier on. I'm going to give you the answer now, and then I want to try to support it. You know what James would tell you? If you have been born of the word of truth, and it's implanted within you, and you have become a hearer of that word coupled with believing prayer, and you are beca- taking the mirror with you and doing the word, the result for the Christian is religion. Religion is a neutral term. It merely means a sacred confession of what you believe to true and devotion to doing what you believe is true. It is a sacred, consecrated commitment of a confession to what you believe is true and a heart to do that truth for the transcendence of the glory of of God. So when we say, I know what we're trying to say when we say Christianity is not a religion. What we really need to do is just add something. Christianity is not a man-made religion. It is a God-given and secured and directed and centered religion. And it is not a religion that declares man made in my, I mean, God made in man's image and a regimen whereby I arrogantly think I can earn my salvation before God. That's a man made religion. What I want is a God given religion. And a God given religion takes God, who declares who I am, made in His image, how I can be right with Him, through Him, and my religion is the result of my relationship with Him, but it is not the avenue of obtaining that relationship with Him. That's ultimately what we're trying to say. So I think we're right-hearted, I just think we're wrong-headed. And I think James would probably take us up to task on this. Now, let me show you why. Take a look with me in verses 26 and 27. In verses 26 and 27, after calling us to be blessed doers of what we've heard because we've been born again, born again, hearing, doing, blessed, 
What does this look like? Well, it looks like pure religion, but first he warns us against false religion. Look at verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious, he automatically assumes. Now, where we're getting to after born again, hearing and doing is the whole issue of religion. So he says this, if anyone, anybody thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue and does not bridle his tongue, what is he doing? He deceives his heart. This person That's the person who thinks they're religious, but they have an unbridled tongue. This person's religion is worthless, which, by the way, tells you there's some religion that must be what? Worthwhile. This is a vain religion. It is not a worthwhile religion. Religion that is pure, now here's the worthwhile, religion that is not defiled but undefiled, Religion that is before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So what is James telling us here? James is telling us three times he uses the word religion. And by the way, he's already used don't be deceived twice. Now he brings another thing in. He says, don't be deceived by worldly wisdom back in chapter one. He says, don't deceive yourself by being a hearer only. Then he says, don't have a deceptive religion. Do not have a deceptive religion. You want a pure religion. What is the pure religion? It flows from It is not the avenue to. It flows from having been born again by the word of truth, having heard the word of truth, having embraced the word of truth. The religion is the consequence of that relationship that is God given to you. But don't fall prey to deceptive religion that gives a false assurance and a false direction. A fellow said to me one time, he said, Pastor, I just think all religions lead to God. I said, well, I do too. That's not a question. The question is not do they lead to God. The question is what does he say when you get there? Worthless are the result of grace. What will he say when you get there? Well done, sacred living before God. Well done, good and faithful servant, or deceptive in rebellion against God in a false religion. There's no doubt that James, here's what I think. How would James answer this question? I think James would say religion is a relation, uh, Christianity is a relationship, not religion. James would say, um, listen, I understand your heart, and let me just say, if you would just put man-made in front of that, I'll go with you. Christianity is not a man-made religion, but let me tell you something. Christianity is a religion. It leads to a sacred way of life before a transcendent God. You live under the eye of God. You desire to lift Him up and praise Him, not only in assembled praise, but with your life. What would he say? What would he say about being a Christian without being religious? He'd say it's impossible. That'd be impossible. Because if you're a Christian, you're going to want to be religious in a way that honors Him. And in fact, it'll show up with three things. Here's what your religion as a result of your relationship with me is going to look like. Number one, a bridled tongue. A bridled tongue. An unbridled tongue shows a false religion, a hypocrisy, a deceitful religion, a man-made religion. Now listen, unbridled tongue. He's not saying that if one's a Christian, then one never has a slip of the tongue. One never falls into a series of statements that would be, no, clearly he's talking about a way of life. He's talking about that when you become a Christian, the tongue is increasingly being bridled and directed. The tongue is being increasingly bridled and corrected. In fact, this is going to be so important to James, he is going to make 11 references to the bridal tongue in the book of James, and I can't go with you with him now. I will later, I promise, because I'll have to later, because he gives 12 verses to the bridal tongue in James 3, 1 through 12. He gives, well, 13 verses. 
James 1 through 12. On James 3, 1 through 12. So he says there'll be the bridled tongue that's there. And then a God-given, God-centered, God-derived, God-produced life, religious life before God for His glory, a sacred life in which we are set apart for His glory, living before God. There'll not only be the bridal tongue, but there will also be the visitation. Notice, personal engagement, visitation of the orphan and the widow. Now, this was very distinct. Israel stood in the midst of the ancient Near East countries. Now, what happened when a woman became a widow? At best, she would be abandoned to the trash heap of the town. Most of the time, she'd be put to death. She was of no use. She was of no good. And there was only one person around that was supposed to provide for her. If her father's gone and her husband's dead, she'll be dead. What about an orphan? Well, that's when their parents are dead. And so how can we handle, what should we do about the orphan? He said, we're not, we don't abandon orphans in God's covenant community. We don't put to death widows. No, we put them on the list is what Paul says. We care for them. We're to minister to them. We are to engage in their life. That's why the Old Testament is preparing us for this with all of it. There were cities built to help the widow and the orphans, cities of refuge. There was the call to God's people to minister to them, whole economic systems. Hey, do you own land? Okay, I hope you, I hope you get a good harvest. Leave the corners for the widows and the orphans. Now notice, give them the opportunity to work. That's dignified. And by the way, if you bind it up and stuff falls out, that's God's providence telling you what to leave behind for the widow and the orphan. So the Bible is full of this, and now we get to the New Testament, and we find this new covenant people with the same direction the, that we are to get. Now listen, this is, see, most of the time we think ministries of mercy like this are for the sensitive, and you ought to be sensitive and compassionate. But let me tell you, to be in the ministry of mercy, you've got to be courageous. You've got to be courageous, and you've got to stay in the battle. Don't leave the battle in the ministry of mercy. All hands on deck, all guns firing. Don't know what part of the ministry of the mercy God's opened up for your heart. But if we're born again, then we're hearers. And if we're hearers and we take the mirror with us, we're going to be doers. And that means we're going to be blessed. And how are we going to be blessed? There's going to be a way of life that comes from us called Christian religion in which a bridal tongue and an intentional commitment into the personal lives of, personally into the lives of widows and orphans will be seen from the life of God's people. They will be visited. It's a very, isn't it an interesting phrase? It's exactly the phrase that was used when it said, God heard the cries of his people in bondage. And Moses said, and he visited Israel with salvation. In their helplessness and hopelessness, he came to the least and the last and the lost to deliver them. And he stayed into it. And this battle is not won by the weapons of the flesh, but the weapons of the Spirit of God that are bound up in the gospel of grace and the armor of the Lord. And then he says, look at the last part. And then he says, keep yourself unstained from the world. Keep yourself unstained. Now, I don't born myself again. I'm born again by God's grace. I'm justified by God's grace. I, all that God has done for me has come down from God to me. Now that God is giving me wisdom to lead life for Him, He says, now personally engage in it and engage in it. And your heart desire is before you were converted, you used to assassinate God's glory and exalt your own that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, now that you're converted, you become a sworn assassin of sin and committed to the glory of God. So you want to keep yourself unstained from the world. That's the language his cousin, John, who also had a brother named James, that's the language he would use. That language, 1 John 
chapter. By the way, why do we want to keep ourselves on? No, please listen to this. Listen to this. You can be forgiven and will be forgiven of all of your sins as a Christian. But we want to keep unstained from the world because sin brings stains and blemishes. It'll rob you of testimony. It'll rob you of a witness. It'll rob you of joy. It'll rob you of relationships. That's why John says, 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world. He's not talking about people. He's talking about that system of rebellion against God. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. For all that is in the world, that system of rebellion, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Lord, I want to keep my, I, I want to keep my appetites under the work of grace, whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do. The appetite of sex, the appetite of power, the appetite to work, the appetite to eat, the appetite to drink. Lord, I don't want to live to do those things. I want to do those things to live for you and enjoy you so that whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you do all to the glory of God. I want to keep unstained, keep the blemishes. I know I've got a perfect positional record of righteousness in Jesus Christ. But in my daily life, I want to not be stained. I want to hate sin. I want to be a sworn assassin of it. And I want to be careful where my eyes are, where my mind is. I want to be careful of all those things. Whatever is good, whatever is pure, let your mind dwell on these things. Folks, listen, the world loves to get the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life to let you know that life is all about you. Go check the magazine stand. We, me, people. Look at the titles. Check the commercials. Just check the commercials. They're all about you. <laughs> How can we make, yes, I mean, in a consumer society where it's all about what I own and enjoy, how can we make yesterday's luxuries today necessity so our GNP will keep growing? It's called advertising. That's what advertising wants to do. Yesterday's, now, if you're in marketing, just do it sanctified. That's what it's aimed to do. <laughs> and it works. And I know you don't think it works. Those little 60-second, 30-second commercials, they don't work, do they? I mean, those idiots pay millions of dollars to put those things on television because they don't work. And it's amazing how they're all about me. I sell a hamburger. Have it your way. You deserve a break today. It's all about me. And they're grabbing at the idolatry strongholds in my heart. But it doesn't work, does it? That world and life view they're communicating doesn't get to us. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, it's all about me. No, it doesn't work with me. Let me try to do a little illustration here. I want to say something. I want you to respond. I know you're a Presbyterian, but please talk out loud, okay? You ready? Here we go. Winston tastes good. L-S-M-F-T. They haven't used those for 45 years. <laughs> and you still remember them. Lodged. Through the eye gate. Through the mind gate. The eyes are the window of the soul. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Well, where does that lead us? Well, let me get to our takeaway this morning. So I will give you all some time to get back there and visit with our friends afterwards. But let me go ahead and get to our takeaway. So what would be the takeaway in answering the questions at the beginning about religion? True religion is the inevitable. In other words, I don't think you can be a Christian without being religious. I didn't say you got to be religious to be a Christian. I just said, if you're a Christian, you're going to end up living a sacred life, confessing truth and living under, before the eye of God. The cr true religion is the inevitable, observable. Religion is external. Christianity begins its work internally, but it won't stay in the heart and soul. It'll come out in the life. 
It'll come out in the speech. It'll come out in the conduct. It will be seen, not as the avenue to heaven, but the evidence of saving grace and on your way to heaven to live your life before the Lord. And it's a growing relationship. You are going to grow in this sacred calling. You see, you're going to go into a world right now that's going to say to you, here's your private religion on Sundays at that Briarwood Presbyterian Church. And by the way, you can't take it out into the streets on Monday through Saturday. And you know what you tell them? No, 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 no. I have the free practice of my religion. And it demands to be practiced in the public square. And so we don't have a private secular life and a, I mean, a private sacred life and a public secular life. For the believer, all of life is sacred. It is a religious enterprise to honor the one who has saved us. So it is a, it is a growing result of a, it is, notice the word result. It's not the avenue, it's the result, the consequence of a grace-secured, Christ-purchased, Holy Spirit-empowered, Bible-saturated relationship with God. So it's not religion to get the relationship. It's the relationship that produces the religion. And it is to be pure and growing and observable, and it's inevitable. And it will have three marks. Now, this is not exhaustive. In fact, please come back next week because chapter 2 takes us to a whole other area of another mark, no personal favoritism, no ism, no racism, no, no um, favoritism, no, uh, no, um, no denial of men and women made in the image of God. How do we deal with them through the gospel of grace? But here are three marks that he brings out of the blessed man. One, they've got this religion as a result, and it's a bridal tongue and a directed life. Now, you say, Harry, wait just a minute. I got the bridal tongue. It's in there. Why did you put the directed life? All right, I'm joining some things together. First of all, first of all here's what Jesus said. Why would James say, if you've got a real relationship and a pure religion, you'll have a bridal? It doesn't mean your tongue's going to be perfect, but you'll have a bridal tongue, and you want your tongue to be seasoned with grace. You want your speech to be seasoned with grace. You don't let no unwholesome word proceed from out of my mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification, that you want that in your life. Because Why? Because that's what's in your heart. What did Jesus tell you? This is what James is drawing from. This is why he's going to mention, he's going to mention the bridal tongue nine, 11 times. He's going to give chapters, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12 to it. Because what, here's what Jesus said, Man speaks out of what has filled his heart. Our speech is reflecting what is filling our hearts. And then James in chapter 3 is going to say, the tongue is a, like a rudder of a ship. Your ship's your life, and the rudder that directs it is what you say. Have you ever noticed when you start lying how many more you got to tell? You, know, you didn't start out to do 30 lies. You just started out with one. By the way, let me give you another. When you speak the truth in love with humility and conviction, you ought to see the doors that opens up for your life. The heart, you can read the heart through the mouth, and then the heart and the mouth set the direction of your life. They begin to set the course of your life. Well, where will that life take you? Into true religion. Let me tell you one place it'll take you, to visit the widows and the orphans. And by the way, that's not all that ministries of mercy. It'll take you into intentional ministries of mercy personally delivered to the powerless and the marginalized. It takes you into those areas to deliver them to the powerless and the marginalized, that we move into their life to minister to them, to bring the truth of the Word of God. We visit them. Let me, can I just give you some words that came to my mind? You see, in Luke 1.68, here's what Zechariah said, the Lord, in the giving of Jesus, the Lord has visited His people with salvation. Notice, Mercy ministries are personal. I thank God for programs 
every single one that guide us. But mercy, this is why ultimately, this is not a discussion politically, but this is ultimately why governmental may, may affirm ministries of mercy, but they can never really deliver them. Mercy ministries have to be delivered personally. It has to be people coming to the powerless and the marginalized. It has to be those in coming, visit them in their affliction. And so that we are all called to this. Now, I don't know which ones you're called to, but we're all called to it. And by the way, he says, the world, they're writing off the orphan and the widow. We embrace them. We embrace them. And so you move into their life personally. You move into their life courageously. You move into their life compassionately. You move into their life graciously. They don't have to merit your engagement. Just their need calls you into their life. You move into their life with thoughtfulness. You move into their life with sacrificial commitments. You visit them as God has visited His people in His Son, Jesus Christ. You get in their place. Christ took your place on the cross in His visitation for your redemption. Vicarious engagement into lives. And then thirdly, you have a thoughtful and relentless pursuit of, hol- of personal holiness. Lord, I don't even want to be, I know positionally I'm perfect, but in life I don't want blemishes on your name and blemishes on my joy in knowing you and loving you. So I got some good news for you. Anybody here ever faltered in, in their lives in personal holiness? Don't raise your hand because I know it's unanimous, and I don't want to call on you if you didn't raise your hand. I have five. The Christian life is like the Clorox pen. Do you all know what a Clorox pen is? I've got five of them. I've got them strategically placed. I am always dropping coffee on ties and shirts. And then I've got to go to a funeral I've got to go to a wedding. I've got to go make a visit. I've got to do counseling. And I've got a stain, a blemish on my tie or my shirt. Clorox pens, the gift of heaven that's come to us. <laughs> Clorox pens. I just take the pen and I go to that tie and I begin to rub it and the blemish is gone. All right, I know I'm perfect in Christ and I don't want to sin I do sin when I do. If we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us and Clorox pin us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, restoring our intimacy with Him. But that doesn't mean I don't, I won't, I'd rather avoid the blemish to start with. That's what by, I'd rather take the grace that lets me say no to the blemish, even though I'm always grateful for the grace that erases the blemish in my life. So, see folks, do you see how this solves our dilemma? Right now there's a big discussion in the church. This side of the church, we believe in public ministries of justice and mercy. This side of the church. We believe in personal holiness, quiet time, get in the Bible, memorize the Scripture, share your faith, etc. Harry, which ones belong in the Christian religion? You know the answer now, don't you? Both of them. More than that, they don't just belong in the religion, they belong in you. That you have both a public ministry of intentional outreach to the powerless and the marginalized to show them the grace of God with gospel deeds and words. And all the while you're fighting the enemy within so that you're saying no to sin and yes to Jesus and growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And that's why he talks about the tongue, because the tongue reflects the heart. What, what will send me, listen to this, what will send me to the powerless and the marginalized to do ministry? What will give me a hatred of sin in my life? A heart that is filled up and is reflected 
in my speech. A heart, God, that you have. Lord, take this heart you gave to me. Do not leave here and think you're going, not going to be religious. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Please listen to me. You're going to leave here. All the people at Athens, Paul said, I see that you're religious. You're going to be religious. Did you know three weeks ago they just had chartered the first church of the atheist in New York? Now, that's an amazing church. Even the atheist is now acknowledging, I'm religious. I believe there was nothing. And nothing said to itself, let's have something. And then something became everything. And everything ordered itself so that I could be here. Well, that's a leap in the dark. For a more rational explanation, please read Genesis 1 through 11. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And the Holy Spirit hovered over it and brought it to fruition. You're going to be religious. It's either going to be deceptive man-made that will end in death and, dis- and chaos and emptiness, or it'll be a pure religion that comes from a vibrant relationship with the God who has loved you and given Himself for you by giving His Son for you when you were helpless and hopeless. And it'll be shown that evidence of that will start to come out with the bridal tongue and intentional ministry and the desire to grow in grace and say no to sin. And that'll be show up. Do you know what... See, this is a perfect example of how these things work together. Evangelism, discipleship, growing personally in grace, and then reaching out in ministry. In the Great Awakening in the 18th century, Whitfield, Edwards, um, uh, Wesley preached. People came to Christ. They began to grow in grace, hate sin. You know what the next thing they did? They started reaching out. That was the birth of orphanages. That's when hospitals and orphanages came into existence and homes for people who didn't have a place. They began to intentionally do those. That's when they started Sunday school, which was to educate kids in the community. That's why they did all of that. Hey, what about abortion? Just give me just a moment with this. Just give me one moment with it. The orphan is there because his parents are dead. The children we're trying to save, the culture and the parents have decided they want them dead. And amazingly, we're in a culture that right now raises the flag against bullying. Do you realize just how schizophrenic we are? I mean, right now, because of technology, we don't have this discussion. Oh, we're only aborting fetuses. I mean, when the last time a lady came up to you and said, Hi, I'm pregnant with a fetus. No, I'm with child. This is a baby. We know what it is. We know exactly what it is. And we've got this schizophrenic law system where doctors... Well, we got a schizophrenic law system where if somebody kills a baby in a womb, they're liable for homicide. They're liable. Do y'all know this thing in Texas right now where you got this woman that has been declared dead and then all that discussion? Now, I'm not going to solve that. I don't have time to solve that for you. I'm not sure I can solve that for you, but here's what I know. Here's the dilemma, and this is what we understand. We don't have one patient there. You got two. You got two patients. The law affirms that. The law recognizes that. Now, how you work through that ethically, that takes a lot of prayer and wisdom from above. But that's what the law calls for. And so we've got this schizophrenic law that these doctors have got to work to save children unless the parents and the government structure says it's okay to kill them. And it's all because of our arrogance. And there's not a bigger case of bullying that I know. Women who are bullied, that's the only answer. 
And then those that can't even speak at all. It's amazing. We don't want bullying in the school place. But the most defenseless child of all, we declare, we will declare, when you're unwanted, you're expendable. And if we minister to orphans, why would we not minister to save their lives? And if we're concerned for widows, why would we not be concerned for women in crisis situations of pregnancy? Folks, this is a war. Get in the battle. Stay in the battle. Don't leave the battle. I don't know where your station is in the battle, and there are many fronts on it. Did you hear Molly Ann's testimony? One of the reasons we asked Molly Ann to be here, because she has shared with you the many fronts. Education, uh, legal issues, adoption, ministry to those in crisis pregnancy. All of it was right there. I don't know where the Lord has called you, but get in the battle. Don't leave the battle. Don't get weary of the battle. Don't grow weary in the battle. Praise the Lord for victories that we've seen. Last year was maybe one of the greatest years on the state level that's ever been here. But this is a battle for life in the name of the one who gives life to reflect redeeming life that brings us to this battle out of worship to God with pure religion. And we're brought to it with all of our hearts. That's the gift that God's given us in this moment and this opportunity. There will be a day, if God brings revival back to this country, there will be a day that this country looks back to this moment and wonder how in the world I mean, just like we look back to slavery and its idiocy, just like we look to the Holocaust in Germany, they will look back to this and wonder how. What I don't want them to say is, where were the Christians? Bridal tongues, personal holiness, and engaged in the battle for the least, the last, and the lost the defenseless, and those who are being callously directed to the destruction of their children by a bullying government and media and educational system. You go there where God's called you and meet it with the weapons of the Spirit divinely fashioned to tear down the strongholds of disobedience to Christ. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together. Thank you, Father, for the uh, privilege to serve you and to exalt Christ in worship and to consider how to serve Christ as we leave here today. Lord, give us tongues that reflect a full heart of grace. Give us lives that are embracing ministries of mercy and grace with both compassion and the courage to stay the fight. And then, Father, give us a desire to grow in the pursuit of holiness in our personal lives. May we not separate any of these. May they be united under the saving grace of Jesus Christ. May they be the result of the Christ purchase Holy Spirit empowered, grace delivered, life of Christ, now lived for Christ. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand? May Christ reign in our country, and may He reign in my heart. May God's grace and mercy and peace be with all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said? Amen. Before we sing, just as you go out, the full panoply of all of the fronts for this ministry are out there. Please take a few moments to see them. Jesus shall reign.